Hi everyone, my name is Sarah. Welcome to Low Cell Life. Uh, this is an introduction of what salicylates are, which usually I include like a little intro for every video, but uh, this one here, we're going to talk about that only, the whole video. Uh, if you are new here and have never heard of salicylates, we'll talk about what it is, uh, why people might be sensitive to it, uh, what the reactions are, and what, um, you know, is it an allergy or is it a sensitivity or intolerance, uh, and then how to avoid them, and just briefly a little bit, like, what contributes to them, like, what are some of the theories, and then also how to mitigate some of the issues, um, like if you have a reaction. So uh, this is going to be a very broad overview. It's not going to go into a ton of detail uh, because each one of those can be unpacked <laughs> with like a research article or more thoughts and theories. And so you can watch some of my other videos uh, for more detailed uh, information. So first of all, you can find uh, a lot of the information that I'm going to say in this video on my website. I have an article called What are Salicylates? And so I'm just going to kind of follow along with some of those and then also give more examples. So the first thing is, what are salicylates? And for, I guess the first thing is, how do you pronounce it? So obviously you've heard me say it, uh, so it's okay to mispronounce it. I used to mispronounce, um, I had a really hard time with, uh, yeah, salicylic acid. So I always wanted to say salicylic acid, which, you know, whatever. You can say whatever you want. If it affects you and your health, just stay away from it. I don't really care how you pronounce it. Salicylates are an organic compound, meaning that it has a carbon backbone. Uh, organic is different than like the trendy version used in commerce for buying organic fruits and vegetables. Uh, you, <laughs> uh, you know, pesticides ha are organic. <laughs> just, just to let you know. So uh, anyway, um, it has a, usually uh, it has a benzene ring as part of the molecular formula, which is a six carbon ring with three double bonds. So, uh, you you know, for the layperson, that doesn't really matter. It's a natural compound. It's uh, made by plants, and it's um, one of the best examples of finding it in nature is in willow bark. There is salicin. It's basically a salicylic acid, uh, which we make aspirin, our modern-day aspirin, is called acetyl salicylic acid. Willow bark has natural salicylates in it, and that's um, what a lot of Native Americans used to use for pain relief uh, in the past. And it's in the leaves, uh, also not just in the willow bark. We realized that this is a great uh, natural form of pain relief, and we were able to replicate what it was in nature and come out with acetyl salicylic acid, and now we have modern day aspirin. Now the idea is, is that uh, people that may be allergic to aspirin are also sensitive to natural compounds found in plants. And so that is the rest of us, uh, probably most of my subscribers, uh, me, I found out about three years ago that I was salicylate sensitive and uh, cutting salicylates out of my diet and that includes uh, like fruits, veggies, and oils, uh, as well as some other items that I'll talk about, uh, has made a world of difference in my health. Uh, I used to be a really big fruit and vegetable eater. I always ate very healthy, uh, probably about five to eight servings of fruits and vegetables a day, easy. Uh, not to mention all the healthy fats like avocado and coconut oil that I used in my diet. Uh, it was a it was a disaster. I was so sick. So let's get back to the plants. If you're not new here, uh, listen up. Uh, salicylates are not only used for uh, plant defense or plant um, kind of as an insecticide. Uh, it's also used for a lot of different things. So uh, usually we think about it being like a natural pesticide that the plants use. And that is true. Uh, that is uh, one of the functions. But they're also really important for uh, flower and fruit development. It functions as a plant hormone. It helps the plant uh, produce lignans and pigments. Uh, unfortunately, most of the low salicylate foods are uh, void of most colors. There's a type of chemical warfare where a plant will drop its leaves and then wherever those leaves land, it will prevent other plants from germinating. Uh, so other 
competitive plant. Uh, so like if it drops a piece of fruit um, with sal salicylic acid in it, then uh, that plant will have a little bit of an advantage over other plants for, for germinating in that area, right? And so that's um, one positive thing for salicylates in a plant. It can also help the plant to handle abiotic stresses uh, like wind, flooding, uh, extreme heat, or maybe drought. So uh, I, I want I want you uh, you folks that have been uh, on this bandwagon for a long time to think of it as more than just a plant pesticide. It, it, it's a lot more than that. The problem with uh, managing a, a low salicylate diet is that it's not it might not just a person may not only be affected by what they consume. Foods that are really high in salicylates include, and I already listed some of them off, but uh, spices tend to be very high in salicylates. So anything that's got like a lot of flavor, a lot of color, uh, a lot of like zest or tang, like those are probably really high in salicylates. So we're looking at uh, anything that's from fruits and vegetables tend to be high in salicylates. There are a handful of fruits and veggies that are low in salicylates. And uh, for an example, we we can, most of us can eat celery, iceberg lettuce, which a lot of people just equate to as water, um, bamboo shoots, uh, peeled pears, and those are probably like some of my staple foods. It's not like the most colorful diet. And then for fats, uh, I mentioned uh, like coconut oil, avocado oil, those are really high. Olive oil is controversial, although it has generally been classified as high. Foods that are low in salicylates or negligible include uh, almost all of your animal products won't have salicylates in it. So animals don't really, we haven't been able to prove if animals uh, produce salicylates. There is some really out there uh, ideas that may think otherwise. Even like shrimps and some cheeses, like they might have a little bit of salicylates in them, uh, like a shellfish, but they tend to be really quite low. Grains and beans also tend to be low. Besides food, it is possible for a person to be sensitive to um, what they put on their body and then also what they inhale. So some of the issues about what you put on your body, you know, you're talking cosmetics, like creams, ointments. Uh, I remember I used to have such bad acne and I was putting salicylic acid on my face and then my acne would get worse and I just thought it was you know, par for the course for acne, but it was actually the salicylic acid that was making my skin worse. Mint, mint toothpaste, right? Um, if you have like uh, bleeding gums or sore, uh, canker sores or kind of blistering in your mouth, it might just be from your mint toothpaste. There are flavor-free toothpastes uh, available, so that might be an option. Uh, perfumes, a lot of perfumes have salicylates in them. Uh, the perfume industry is knowledgeable and do acknowledge that people can be salicylate sensitive. So they are a lot of higher quality uh, perfumes are looking for ways to not include salicylates in perfumes. So it might be possible that there might be a perfume that doesn't bother you. It'd be tough to find. <laughs> of course, in the case of like the perfumes and then the next option is for cleaners and um, solvents and different uh, chemicals that you use in your house, uh, both for cleaning uh, things like, you know, gluing down flooring or uh, maybe even how your uh, new furniture or mattresses are uh, treated, they might have uh, salicylates as part of the product that you get or that you use. Those would not be natural compounds. They're usually synthetic compounds. And so sometimes those are really bad. One of my most severe reactions, I was at an antique shop. I do a lot of vintage fashion and love like um, a lot of like 1940s stuff. So I always go to antique stores. Uh, there's one that I now avoid, uh, especially, especially the basement. They have a ton of mothball uh, deterrents. That mothball, that really minty, uh, kind of like a eucalyptus smell. Eucalyptus is another one. Um, that uh, when I inhale that, that, that's like my most fierce reaction that I've had. Uh, other inhalants include, you know, um, essential oils. Those are really high in salicylates. So you can eat it, you can inhale it, and you can um, absorb it through your skin. On the skin issues, some kids have um, OD'd from aspirin use, and that's from like using like the Salon Pass or the um, Icy Hot. Those have salicylates in them. So if you put those on your skin, it absorbs. You put it all over your skin, and too often in a day, you can get an aspirin uh, overdose. Aspirin overdose is a little bit different, but it's still, the same, a very similar concept. It's, it's really about dose. 
So we'll move on to the next part. And uh, this here is going to be like, is it an aspirin allergy, aspirin sensitivity, aspirin intolerance, uh, salicylate intolerance, salicylate sensitivity, you know, how, how do you describe it? To be a true allergy, you have to have uh, a reaction to a protein, which triggers your immune response. So uh, that is a true allergy. You can be uh, allergic to foods like uh, the protein in wheat, a protein in milk, a protein in um, beef, you know, depending on what your allergy is, uh, you can, you know, peanuts, nuts, different things like that. So that's a true allergy. Uh, in aspirin, because it's a chemical compound, it doesn't have that protein and it doesn't really trigger an immune response. But one of the immune response reactions, right, tends to be a histamine reaction. Histamine is uh, on your skin, it's in your gut, uh, it's in your mouth, uh, in your tissues and stuff, uh, mostly on epidermis, like uh, outside tissues. The histamine reaction is where people get into a lot of trouble with allergy reactions, right? You may have heard of anaphylaxis, that uh, an extreme anaphylaxis reaction or anaphylactic shock is when your body, you know, your, you have your throat swell up and you end up having a very severe reaction that may also include death, right? Uh, not good. In the case of aspirin, because it's not an allergy, uh, because it's not a protein, it's acceptable to say that you have an, uh, an allergy-like reaction or that you can say that you're um, aspirin sensitive or aspirin intolerant or salicylate intolerant, salicylate sensitive. That's good to know just from a technical point of view. Does it change what you do or how you respond to it? Possibly. I'd like to debunk one myth and that is, like I said, um, the histamine reaction is very intense and a lot of people have this reaction, but I, I think that there are salicylate sensitive people that may not have a histamine reaction. They might just get like body aches and not necessarily uh, allergy type response. Uh, it might just be like chronic pain. Uh, one of my symptoms for salicylate sensitivity is uh, I have a muscular disorder called dystonia and I will get muscle spasms. So my muscle spasms aren't a histamine reaction. Although I do get a histamine reaction too uh, from salicylates. So, uh, you know, those are two different reactions playing off of that. So I think it's possible to have both uh, a histamine reaction and or other chronic illnesses related to it. So it's important to know the difference between those two. Intolerance and sensitivity are slightly different in terminology. An intolerance, uh, you know, culturally, being intolerant is not a good thing these days. Uh, usually, uh, you know, we think about being like racially or uh, maybe gender intolerant, you know, like those are really harsh ways to describe people. It seems very rigid, uh, not very modern and not very um, yielding in a sense. In the sense of a chemical intolerance, uh, one of the issues, um, what that really means is that you're just not able to break down a compound, right? So uh, if you have lactose intolerance, it means you don't have lactase, an enzyme to break down lactose. It's just not feasible. So that's one way to think about uh, salicylate intolerance. Some people might not just be able to break it down. I think that salicylate sensitivity is probably a little bit more of a better description. And sensitive in a chemical or biological sense means that you uh, adapt to a stimulus. Okay, you receive a stimulus and you react to it. In our culture, right, being a sensitive person usually indicates like some kind of weakness or that you're a little bit finicky or that you overreact, you know, kind of some really not nice um, feelings with it, right? And so it's really hard to say when I'm salicylate sensitive, people will think, well, it's obviously not uh, a serious issue and, you know, She's just being picky, right? So it, it kind of, it just sucks to have to use that even though that is the best description of what is happening. The difference uh, to me between uh, intolerance and salicylate sensitive uh, is that intolerance, it, because it's rigid and you have the inability to break something down, it really doesn't describe salicylate sensitivity uh, to the best of its ability, right? Uh, most people can handle small amounts of salicylates. The issue is when you have too many, that's when you can have a reaction. Most people can eat off the 
the negligible or low lists. So they can handle a certain amount and then their body has to get rid of it. Um, and if they get too much, then that's when they get sick. So being sensitive is really probably the best description out of all the th options. However, because of myths like uh, food intolerances aren't life-threatening, uh, food sensitivities aren't life-threatening like an allergy is, that is false. If somebody has a histamine reaction to a chemical or protein, it can be life-threatening. It is possible that people can be extremely sensitive to just a tiny, tiny amount of salicylates so that it is really like a true allergy, but it really isn't. So we want to be educated on what the differences are. If you go to a restaurant and somebody's preparing food for you, and if you are very sensitive to salicylates, I think that it's appropriate to use what is culturally normal to use to describe a very serious, potentially life-threatening food issue by using the term allergy, even if you're not, because what it conveys is that it is serious you do want them to use clean or not uh, cross-contaminated um, uh, utensils and that kind of thing. So uh, it is, people understand what allergy is, they don't understand the other terms, and until there's more education, I think that it's probably acceptable to use allergy. I don't have anything else better to <laughs> suggest or describe there. <laughs> All right, let's talk about symptoms. So uh, some of the most common symptoms for salicylate sensitivity tend to be asthma, uh, respiratory issues, sinus problems, nasal sinus polyps. Uh, those uh, tend to be quite a, a, a good group of people have those reactions. Uh, for me, I kind of get that asthma um, shortness of breath feeling, uh, especially when I'm exposed to perfumes or uh, chemicals in the air. Like if it's respiratory, if it's airborne and I inhale it, that's usually what my reaction is. Uh, other reactions uh, include digestive issues, stomach problems, kind of IBS issues, cramping, bloating, gas, all the fun at toilet stuff. Uh, th these can be really common uh, problems for salicylate sensitivity. Another group is a uh, skin issues. Uh, my mom had terrible eczema before she went on a low salicylate diet. And once she stopped, her eczema completely cleared up. I mean, she had peeling skin on her hands. Uh, I get hives, so sometimes I, I will cheat and I'll have a little bit of caffeine in my coffee. Um, I get acne on my face, like every, you can count how many cups of coffee I had based on how many zits I have on my face. So uh, I just thought I just had adult acne my entire life, but no, it was just a reaction. I worked in coffee too for like 15 years. Uh, so you know, it's, you can have skin issues, uh, hives. Um, and then, of course, you can have um, a histamine reaction in your mouth, bleeding gums, uh, like I said, canker sores, um, throat swelling. I've had an anaphylaxis reaction before to a, a high salicylate day, uh, that kind of thing. Other really random reactions, and these are less common, but I have included them in the list because I have personally dealt with them, and I have also confirmed that I have them when I eat salicylates, or like a medium or low amount of salicylates. Um, one that I've had, I suffered from night terrors uh, as a child, again in my mid-20s when I was in a house that used a lot of fragrant products uh, and we had a lot of fruits and vegetables during that time. I had terrible, terrible night, uh, night terrors and then, uh, so basically nightmares. Uh, now if I have uh, something off the medium salicylate list like a peach, uh, I will have a little bit of insomnia uh, that night and also some nightmares. So that's an unfortunate uh, thing, but fortunate that I figured it out. So now that I'm on a low salad diet, I really don't have, uh, I don't suffer from those things anymore. And those have uh, subsided since doing that. And then the last one that's just so amazing for me and just a huge bonus was I had uh, blepharospasm, spasm, which is eye spasms in my eyes. I had them in my jaw and my face. I had them all over my body. Um, dystonia all over my body, uh, mostly in my back, uh, sometimes in my thighs and my hips. And after going low sal, it took about a month, but I no longer have to take medicine. I am no longer as disabled as I used to be. Uh, I, I don't have to be medicated. I don't have the symptoms unless I'm exposed to salicylates. And with that dystonia, I will also say I got in a car accident about seven years ago and suffered from back pain. And I could never figure out if it was a back pain the car accident pain became dystonia pain. I never was able to really tease that apart, but since uh, going on a low salicylate diet, 
my back pain has also resolved. So I will get back and neck pain uh, in my body if I have salicylate. So if you're suffering from back pain, and especially with one of the other symptoms, you should try a low salicylate diet. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> there are a few diets to follow, and uh, this one is one, ARPA. Uh, it's by Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Uh, this is an elimination handbook, diet handbook. Uh, they look at more than just salicylates. Generally, people will have several chemicals that they're sensitive to. Uh, for me, I've only really ruled out salicylates, so I consider myself fortunate. Um, with the uh, the elimination diets, so ARPA is one, uh, Fine Gold is another, and yeah, and then there's another one called Fail Safe, and that one has a lot of information from FedUp.com.au. So uh, those are three elimination diets that you can look at, and they cover more than just less lights, they cover a lot of other chemicals. Basically, you go on a really strict diet, and then you can introduce foods. Um, you know, once your symptoms drop, then you start trying out foods, and then when you react to them, um, you know, you'll stop eating that food, wait to heal up, and then um, have another food later. And go through until you find out exactly what you're sensitive to. There's not a lot of information about why uh, people have salicylate sensitivity. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of these thoughts, but some of the uh, things I've seen floating around include um, that it's just genetic and that's the way you are. I think that that's probably my case. Uh, my mom has it. I have it. Uh, I've had it my whole life, I'm pretty sure. And so uh, I'm not really interested in trying to figure out what's causing it and how to fix it. I, this is just, uh, I'm at peace now that I know and uh, I'm able to have a healthy enough diet that I feel good and that's enough for me. There are a lot of people with the MTHFR methylation uh, gene. Um, I do have that gene and uh, I'm not really convinced that it is salicylate re uh, related. I think there's just so many people with that gene that there's obviously going to be a good portion of it in the salicylate sensitive groups. One thought that I have come across uh, a few times is that uh, if you have a dust mite allergy uh, issue, which I do and so does my mom, uh, that you might also have an aspirin allergy. There's a few sources that are related to that. MCAS is one, uh, MCAS, mast cell activation syndrome. Some people with that have an issue with um, eating uh, salicylates. Uh, histamine intolerance, it may or may not be related to that, but uh, basically anything that can increase your histamine, uh, you know, you, you'd want to avoid. And the last one I'll mention is, oh, the last two, uh, uh, multiple chemical sensitivity, MCS. So this is uh, when people are really sensitive to just any type of uh, chemicals, right? Uh, these are the people that are sensitive to, you know, in your offices, they're sensitive to fragrance, uh, all the cleaners that they use in the office, that kind of thing. So. Um, Sometimes there's an overlap with that. And the last one is some people do try a low salicylate diet that have fibromyalgia. There is a thing called the uh, guafenesin protocol. So they say go on a low salicylate diet uh, so that your guafenesin will work and then however the function uh, happens, it drops something in your body and then you're able to live life with fewer fibromyalgia symptoms. Um, I think that uh, I've looked into fibromyalgia for myself because I was so chronically ill and sick and tired for so long that that was uh, a pathway that we were starting to go down and explore. Uh, going on a low salicylate diet took all those symptoms away, so uh, I think it's possible that you know people with symptoms like I had would easily be classified as fibromyalgia, whether or not it is true fibromyalgia or not. Right? They're classifying that by uh, which symptoms you have and if you hit so many check boxes in a in a mark. So, you know, that's, that's a possibility too. Okay, and the last section we're gonna talk about are treatments. So basically, uh, the only way to really do <laughs> great on, uh, you know, managing your salicylate sensitivity and to get better really is to just avoid it. Uh, there are different schools of thought where, and of course, I would imagine it depends on what your, your cause is, right? Um, we're only describing salicylate sensitive by the symptom, not by the cause, right? We're all in a big pool that says we're salicylate sensitive, but there could be a whole bunch of different reasons causing that. So when you're talking about what the treatments are, uh, you have to consider what the cause is. 
not where the symptom is. So just kind of think about that. One, uh, so there's a couple of different schools of thought as far as how to treat or manage it, and I'll just cover a couple of things. So the first is obviously to avoid it. You avoid it, you feel better. Some people are so sensitive, they'll never actually be able to get those foods back in their life or those chemicals um, just back into rotation to a normal level. Some people think that if you uh, drop down really low, you allow your body to heal, then you can probably start adding um, more of the medium foods or even have a high food every once in a while. Uh, so that is a way to manage it. Uh, another idea is the bucket theory, which is basically if, let's say you can um, handle 10 units of salicylates in a day, however that's measured. Uh, if you eat 11 in a day, then you're gonna have one extra. And if you eat 11 consistently every day, then you're gonna be oh, too many salads in your bucket, right? There, you have one from Monday, one from Tuesday. One, by the time you get to Friday, you're gonna have five extra units of salads, right? That's way too much because your body can only digest and get rid of 10 in a day. So the idea is, you know, maybe you eat 10 in a day and then the next day you eat four and then maybe the next day you can eat 12. You know, you're gonna go out to dinner, you kind of plan ahead for that. You know, and you kind of uh, figure out what your level is, what your, you know, what your, what you can handle and then you kind of manage that. Another option is to do chemical desensitization in countries that do believe in salicylate sensitivity, unlike in the United States. Uh, they do offer clinics where you can go and kind of like an allergy shot, you can get uh, an aspirin tablet, usually it's dissolved in your, on your tongue, and build up a tolerance to aspirin again. And then of course there's the idea that if you end up uh, having a reaction, how do you treat that? Um, some of the most popular ways are, um, I take a Benadryl, usually that almost always helps. I never ever eat out and drink on the same night. Uh, just in case I have a reaction, I can take a Benadryl and be able to just go to bed and start the next day new. Uh, so uh, Benadryl helps with my closing of my throat. Uh, it helps with my um, the hives and itchiness. Another option is uh, some people say that they will drink water with a little bit of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda mixed in. They'll put one teaspoon for a glass of water, drink that down, and that sometimes helps um, manage it. And the last thought is to help your body eliminate it faster. Some uh, One of the other thoughts about why uh, it happens is like sulfur issues, which is important in detoxing or removing chemicals from your body. So a nice home remedy is to take a warm bath with Epsom salts. Epsom salts are um, magnesium sulfate and the sulfur it can be absorbed through your skin and help aid in the removal of salicylates from your body. Uh, you can find me on Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, at Low Sal Life, and I hope that you've learned a few things. Uh, thanks so much for joining me and sticking around to the end, and I will see you next week. Bye.